another important shape that finds uh, tremendous utility in chemistry is the hexagon. So here we have uh, my attempt at drawing a regular hexagon, which should have six sides all the same length and six equal angles. And to uh, elucidate the proper rotations that are available to this particular shape, let's do one other thing is to number the vertices. And we're just going to number them in counterclockwise. And <clears throat> You want to see what a particular rotation does in terms of moving one vertex to another. So, for example, uh, one rotation that we have available is to rotate by 60 degrees. So we have a 60 degree rotation. And what we notice about this 60 degree rotation is that it takes vertex 1 to vertex 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 5, 5 goes to 6, and 6 goes to 1. So, except for the numbering, the resultant shape after having turned it by 60 degrees looks exactly the same as it did before. So, therefore, we can say that this particular shape has, as a symmetry operation, a C6 rotation. So, as we noticed before, 360 divided by 6 gives us 60 degrees. So, that's one of the rotations that's available. One thing I should point out here is that uh, when we rotate the shape, it rotates around a center point. Center point. So if we consider this center point to be part of the hexagon, it is the one point of the entire shape that does not move during the rotation. So we're going to be interested in this course in these types of motions that leave at least one point that doesn't move. And typically, the point will often be the center so here we have a C6 rotation. But do we have any other possible rotations? Well, we could start at vertex number one, but this time, since we move it by two bits, so that we move vertex one to three, and we would notice right away this is a rotation of 120 degrees. And the effect of this rotation would be to move vertex one to three, two would go to four, 3 would go to 5, 4 would go to 6, and 5 would go to 1. At the same time, the center point would stay where it was. The fancy word that we use to say that a point does not move, we say is that it's invariant. So our 120 degree rotation here tells us that we have a C3 operation. C3 operation. So it has C6 and it has C3. And just continuing on this particular theme of the two rotations that we see so far, we also notice, among other things, that if I did two C6s in a row, that has the same effect as doing a C3 operation all in one shot. So one way we can write that is, we can write that C6 times C6 equals C3. Now this idea that we can do two or more operations and have the equivalent effect to a third operation will become increasingly important. For the time being, we just noticed that we can either do a C6 followed by a C6 or we can do a C3 all at once. And in either case, we have symmetry operations of the regular hexagon. Sticking to the C6, we also notice that if we were to rotate clockwise, so such a way as to rotate in 60 degrees, taking vertex one to vertex six, this would give me, <clears throat> since I'm going in the opposite direction, would give me the C6 to the minus one. So not only do we have C6, we have C6 to the minus one as a symmetry operation of the object. Does it work the same way for the 120 degree rotation? Well, let me imagine if I rotate my hexagon by 120 degrees clockwise, that would take vertex one to vertex five, vertex six to vertex four, vertex five to three, four to two, 
and 3 to 1. And since I'm going in the opposite of our standard direction, so I'm going clockwise instead of counterclockwise, that tells me that that particular rotation will be C3 to the minus 1. So not only is C3 a symmetry operation of this particular shape, but C3 to the minus 1 is also the shape. Now, it's a good time now to kind of show the greater significance to this notation of writing C3 to the minus 1. We notice down here that I can think of a C3 rotation as being essentially the same effect as two C6s done in a row. Well, now let's see what happens if I do a C6 in the counterclockwise direction and follow that with a C6 in the clockwise direction. So first I move one to two, two to three, all around, and then I go backwards. I go from six to five, five to four, four to three, three to two, and two to one. And if I work that out in detail, I notice the following, that if I do a C3, and this is typically how we write it, we write in order from right to left. So we do the C3 operation first, and follow it by the C3 to the minus one operation. The overall effect is as if I had done nothing. So one way we can write this is as a C1, which as we've already seen before, also goes by the special name of E, for Einheit, for the identity. So we see this idea of the identity being formed by a operation and its inverse. So the idea of to the minus one being the inverse of C3, we can think of it formally in terms of making a rotation and then a rotation in the opposite direction. And we'll see later on that we can do it mathematically as well. Are there any other symmetry operations, uh, proper rotations for the regular hexagon? Yes, there are. Again, as we could rotate from vertex one to two, and that would be a C6. We can go from one to three, which would be a C3. We could also rotate but this time, we have enough room here, where one goes to four. So we can actually rotate by 180 degrees. That would take vertex one to four, two would go to five, three would go to six, and four would go to one. So in that case, we noted in black color here, that would give us a C2. So that would give us a C2 operation. Now, we could just as well have rotated in the clockwise direction, but that would give us exactly the same arrangement of vertices as if we had gone in the counterclockwise direction. So we could write this formally is that C2 and C2 to the minus one have exactly the same effect. So in these, locate, these uh, situations where uh, we just have two different ways of writing exactly the same symmetry operation, we only use one of the notations. So in general, we like to use the simplest possible notation. And in that case, it would be a C2. So what we're noticing here is that as far as proper rotations go, we found we have C1, which always exists. We have C2, we have C3, C3 to the minus one, C6, and C6 to the minus one. So we have many, many different proper rotations for the six-sided regular hexagon. Now, one thing we uh, need to mention now also is that all the proper rotations that we've done so far have been in the plane of the board. So basically, we consider uh, the whiteboard to be an XY coordinate system, essentially R2, uh, the X and Y axes. Then the rotation takes place entirely in the XY plane. And the axis of rotation can be thought of as do this carefully, as this piece of dowel, as a stick going through the board, and this would be the z-axis, and this would be the axis of the actual rotation. So the rotations that we've looked at so far have this z-axis as the axis of rotation. But that's not the only axis which is available. So let's take a look at an example where uh, we have other possible types of rotation. So let's erase this for the time being, and remind ourselves again of the case with the square. So recall that we had a square, and in the case of the square, we had already seen that we have a number of different possible rotations. We have C4. So let's put the vertices in here just so we can 
be more explicit about the effect of each rotation. So we would recognize that a C4 rotation would take vertex 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and then 4 to 1. We would also have C4 to the minus 1. So that's a C4 in the opposite, the clockwise direction. That would take 1 to 4, 4 to 3, 3 to 2, and then 2 to 1. And then we had seen, in addition to the identity operation, that the square also has a C2. And the C2 would take vertex 1 to 3, 2 to 4, 3 to 1, and 4 to 2. But those are all the rotations in the plane. So again, we would possibly draw a center point there, and we'd realize that the axis of rotation for all of these uh, proper rotations goes through that particular point. That one particular point would be invariant. It wouldn't move no matter how much the square rotated. And here we're thinking of the rotation of the square almost like a CD or a 45 or a 33 and a third vinyl record on a turntable. And then the whiteboard would be the plane of the disc or the turntable. But we also have other possible rotations. So in this case, let's take a piece of paper. So here we have a piece of green paper that is shaped like a square. So the types of rotations we've looked at so far would be correspond to rotations. That's a C4. We could do like that, and that's a C2 for 180 degree rotation. But it's also possible to take the square and rotate it this way, essentially flipping over the square. So we could flip over the square that way. That is also a C2 rotation. If we look at it from the side, we can kind of see more easily that we rotate by 180 degrees. It's still horizontal, for example. So these out-of-plane rotations are also extremely important, and they are part of our description of a plane figure. So whenever we have a figure that's actually in the plane, we will have these rotations that essentially take the figure out of the plane. So let's see which kind of rotations we would have for a square on the whiteboard. So one of the ways that we can rotate our square would be along a line going through here. And then we have a rotation going counterclockwise. So we have a C2 rotation like this. And this is effectively flipping over the square. And this is one of the axes of rotation. And we flip it um, in the y direction in this particular case. That's one of the possible axes of rotation. We can also have an axis of rotation that goes this way. And then we flip over in this direction, that's another C2, and that would flip it in the x direction. So for a square, we have these lines that go through the midpoint of each side, of the opposite sides, and then we have a C2 that goes through those points. So we have two additional C2s. But if we have a square, we have even more possible C2 operations that we can perform on the square. We notice that if we take a diagonal, draw a line along the diagonal, so long as it's a square, I can flip it over diagonally, C2 this way. So it would be equivalent in the case of our green piece of paper to holding it at the corners and flipping it like this. So as long as I do that, I can flip it in this direction. I get exactly the same shape back that I started with. So we have a C2 along not only one diagonal, but along both diagonals. So along this axis, I have another C2 operation. So not, not only do we have the in-plane rotations for our plane figures, but we also have these out-of-plane rotations. And to completely describe any geometric shape, we have to tabulate every single symmetry operation. And we'll see that the number of, of these operations, these different ways of moving the object that still make it look the same, the actual total number of those operations will be critically important. And that will tell us not only the specific type of figure that we have, but we shall soon see that chemically it will tell us, tell us very important features of the chemical properties of a compound that has that particular shape. It's ultimately these chemical properties that we're interested in as chemists, 
while mathematicians are interested in the the beauty and the symmetry and the mathematical properties, as chemists, we're most interested in how those mathematical properties translate into chemical physical properties that we can measure and observe. Chemical physical properties that we can measure and observe.